When we are doing the will of our true self, we are inevitably doing the will of the universe. In magic, these are seen as indistinguishable. That every human soul is in fact one human soul. It is the soul of the universe itself. And as long as you are doing the will of the universe, then it is impossible to do anything wrong. My name is Revel Raz, and this is Prag Magic. In this podcast, we will journey through the investigation and application of metaphysical means to enhance and inspire what I consider to be the great unifying purpose of our short human existence, the creative process. And it's my intention to learn and reveal exercises that ex-hex those inner oppressive thought patterns, as well as exorcising those lurking psychic vampires. Join me as I consort the unseen as means for getting the fuck out of creative stagnation. Stagnation that bewitches each and all of us, artists or not. This week marks the anniversary of my tenure, albeit short tenure, with the infamous online weirdo and witches journal, disinfo.com. It was truly a major high five to my younger self. I was able to contribute to the long, strange pantheon of luminaries and thinkers that helped shape my occulting and metaphysical journey since I was but a wee punk. Disinformation especially the Richard Metzger era from when I was young. Uh, He now runs DangerousMinds.net. But in any case, uh, Disinformation published The Book of Lies, which that book especially imbued in me the rock and roll occultism my porous rebellion quenched as a young seeker. From the psychotronic magics of psychic TV, William S. Burroughs, Grant Morrison, and the one and only Robert Anton Wilson, I was set. But in the last remaining years of Disinfo, Audio Sorcerer, Psychonaut, and Edgelord Slayer Thad McCracken was given the reins to the Disinfo Kingdom, long before I had come around as a writing contributor, but not long after the company veered heavy into the online blogging behemoth many of us magical misfits came to peruse on the regular. For good and for bad, Thad accepts that heavy burden of that site's twilight years from the inner turmoil amongst its contributors to the solidification of anchoring a discordant society of ne'er-do-wells and battling the naysayers within the edgelord annals of internet history. So it is my honor to welcome Thad McCracken, late editor of Disinfo.com, audio sorcerer, Psychonaut and straight up weirdo. So, slither hither, weirdos and witches. Here's my conversation with the illustrious Thad McCracken. Thanks so much for taking the time to do this. 
faux shizzle, man. Yeah, no problem. Definitely. <laughs> well, I think uh, I got a lot of topics I want to talk to you about. Um, I thought we'd start, though, with disinfo just because it's topical. Yes, we can, we can talk about the topical time. We're just going to go right into it. Gotcha. Okay. Um, yeah, why not? Okay, cool. Yeah, I didn't know if there's gonna be like introductions or whatever, but yeah, let's just let's just roll. Uh, so, um, man, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I said, I, I I wish I was talking to you under better circumstances, but unfortunately, yeah, this info got taken down, and what's what's fucked up is it got taken down for like honestly a very legit reason. Uh, a very I mean, legit the, reason. Well, yeah, I mean, sadly, the fact of the matter is, like that site was using potentially copyrighted images forever like ever since i've been writing about it and like for a really long time right and, and the thing is that's not technically legal it's like sort of like smoking weed and um um you know speeding you know like just because smoking weed was illegal you know until 2012 in washington didn't mean i didn't smoke weed every day i speed every way to, day to work websites you know, use images and they're like, hey, credit this. And I was doing it on the side too. I was trying to do this, like, you know, like shit that I thought no one's ever going to sue me if I like rip a Doctor Strange image, like Marvel doesn't give a fuck or, you know. And, and, and the thing about doing this is in most cases, really all that's going to happen is they're just going to be, hey, like, take that down, right? And there was a DMC takedown notice right on the site. I was running it for over a year. Nobody ever e emailed me once about anything. But the problem is there's now things like, um, a lot of these companies like YouTube have technology where they go scanning websites looking for copy, you know, it's called essentially copyright trolling. The word I was completely not familiar with. Um, so they actually use programs that go through and just scan stuff. And that's sort of what happened to this info is, um, is yeah, I mean, it was some copyrighted and I don't even really know the details. And that's just, I, I could read between the lines that that's sort of what happened. And so the problem is they do this to try and shake you down, which they technically can legally do. You know, they're basically like, hey, we don't want to sue you, you know, give us money. And so to back up a little bit, and, and it's a completely legit reason. And what's so funny is like I do a podcast with Jake Dill, who's a DJ who works for like iHeartMedia, which is like this huge evil media conglomerate. You know, uh, he's on like a legit radio DJ in L.A. And yeah, I mean, they have training about what you can do and not do in copyright. Disinfo was never doing that. Like, admittedly, like, we were getting people, like, myself included, nobody was ever giving you any, like, you know, we weren't paying anybody, because, I mean, it was never that big of a, a company. And that is the sad thing about being taken down by such a stupid thing, is that, we weren't, you know, we weren't making any money. It's not like we were making any money off of these images at this point. But the problem is, it used to be a big corporation. It's still officially a company, you know, so. Well, let's um, get into that. I wanted to talk to you what, how you got involved. I have read somewhere that it was after yeah. kind of your big uh, psychonaut kind of journey. That yeah, that yeah, that's info. actually, well, well, first of all, I mean, I've been probably like yourself, uh, uh, fans of this info for a long time. Um, and, and, and yeah, I know if I, I just like back it up and finish the thought. So why this did take down this info though, is essentially because the owner wanted to retire a while ago. He really just wanted nothing to do with it. He wouldn't, didn't, I could be vibe that he probably lost a lot of money, money off of it in the last several years. And so he oh. was like, officially like, I'm not putting any more money into this. So was he at all happened, involved was, with the Richard Metzger era? Oh yeah, no, he's been around the guy that, yeah, uh, uh, Gary had been around, the guy who still owned it had been around from the beginning, but myself, no. Yeah, so how I got involved with this info is a, uh, 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 oh, and thanks for you contributing, by the way, uh, you know, uh, hey, it was recently, and yeah. On the bucket list, I, I've, like you said, uh, been, been a fan of it forever. It's kind of the reason why I'm in to a lot of this, especially the chaos magic stuff got me yeah. going, so. It was an honor. Yeah, me, myself as well. No, and thanks for contributing. It was, it was, I guess, an honor to run it for a year, a year and a quarter. And what's so funny is I was kind of like half-assedly running it. And I was planning on 2019 because I had a couple projects that should finish it up. So the plan was like really ramp it up and try and see if I could get it profitable. And so I'm definitely glad this happened before I did any of that. Did you manifest like really... this? No, <laughs> uh, well, we could talk about that later. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in, in a way... I think maybe I did, and I was shown some things that I'm not going to get into in some trances that, like, I, I think I, well, I've been told exactly why this had to happen, and it's actually really fucked up. So uh, I'm, not, I'm not going to get into it, 
that's that's sort of the role I went with magic, but I can give some hints. I can at least talk about philosophically why possibly I did kill it. Um, but you know, on a subconscious level. But anyways, yeah. So the story of how I got, got into this info is that in fact, sort of again, like you man, what the funny thing is, I had been uh disinfo is literally you know, and I'm old enough, I'm 41 now. So I actually like remember uh, when the internet was really just like, you know, I, I mean, like I didn't even use it. I didn't even have cable internet until I, I don't think like 2006. So I remember like way back in the dial up days. And so like way back then, this thing started in 1996. And this is the sad part about it dying is that it was around for like, I, I, it was coming right up on 22 years. Like, and it was like one of the kind of original website and it still probably is like the longest running countercultural website uh in, in the world i don't know what what would have to catch up to it i guess if you consider daily grail like a countercultural website which is more of a paranormal like they're about to hit 20 i think so like they'll probably beat it uh but so that's what so yeah i mean i've been into this for years like it was one of the first sites that i ever actually regularly checked way back in like the dial-up internet days i had all the books like i uh had you know they put out dvds so yeah i mean exactly it was a huge influence on like who i was as a person and I was a fan for years. Um, and so in 2012, actually, I ended up doing this acid ritual. Uh, and yeah, and this is, and, and so I have to preface this by saying, cause you bring up 2012 and everybody is instantly like, Oh, that's so retarded. And, and I, I never ever thought ever that there was going to be some sort of like apocalypse or anything like that in 2012. But in 2010, I started receiving kind of weird downloads of information. And also, I wasn't willing to just like completely discount like the Mayans and stuff. More to the point, I thought that regardless of the way, if you're kind of looking at um, consciousness from more of a standpoint of sorcery, this idea that something was going on in 2012 was sort of embedded into the counterculture through people like Grant Morrison Daniel and uh, Pinchbeck. Daniel Pinchpick yeah. and, uh, and um, of course, Terrence McKenna, who had the came up with the timeway zero. And that's probably the reason, you know, so it was this feedback loop. So I'm like, okay, maybe there is some weird energy there. The other thing is I just released this album called an echo through the eyes of forever by my old band black science. And so, and that was a really weird, <laughs> that's a story in itself. The band that broke up before this album ever came out. Right. And, and so not only that, we actually named the final track that we were working on uh, our sentences up because Dean who was recording our album had the book that Patrick Meany, I believe in the studio called our sentences up and we had an instrumental final track. And I was like, okay, that's the name of the track. And I picked it. And then, when we were, once I gave it that name, like then like a week later on the same day, my brother came into the studio and told me he was moving out of town to Edmonton and the drummer was having a kid. So like, <laughs> like we named this song, our senses up. And then like, like less than a week later on the same day, I sort of realized that that band was sort of over, which was just, and it, and it was like right before 2012. So anyway, so I had this album and, and the weird postscript to that story is that album is by far the most like successful music I've made by a band that broke up before it even came out. So, you know, it's like, yeah, it's not the way shit works, man. Uh, and, and I think I just said, too, this is so my experience with magic, you know, the universe, <laughs> the idea that the universe is, is going to give you what you want. It's kind of, kind of going to give you what you need. Uh, so that's just, it's just the way it, it always sort of works. So anyways, I, uh, most of my rituals at this point, I was just sort of thinking about, um, magic and more kind of doing psychedelics in a more ritualistic sense. I, you know, I, I, I didn't even really do psychedelics that often in my life anymore. And I, I did a lot of times during recreational and I sometimes when I was younger did kind of more ritualistic usage. Um, but this time I had some good LSD and I kind of did a ritual with my wife, which was fun. But then I was like, you know what, this album is going to come out. So I, I actually had three albums because, uh, a friend of mine mastered some of my old electronic tracks and I put kind of like two compilations of albums of that, of like kind of old basement stuff that I did that uh, my friend remit or remastered for me. So I actually had three albums. So I planned this ritual around the Holy Trinity and like I took a day off work where like no one was up, else was going to be around. And so I just went full on and did an acid audio ritual. Now, there's a couple of interesting things I can say about this ritual is that one, there's a huge difference between doing psychedelic drugs ritualistically and doing them um, recreationally. Like, and, and I don't really do them recreationally anymore because when I've started doing them recre ri uh, ritualistically, yeah, I mean, it's, there's, there's just so much of a level of communication. And what I say is rather than like saying, hey, this is going to be a fun afternoon or whatever, or I'm going to go to a rock concert or something, literally saying, I'm going to try and communicate 
with a higher intelligence. You know, think about it in that more shamanic context. So I did that. And the point to these rituals, by the way, was to, I had a new album out. I wanted to get that out to more people um, than my other music had been, or other stuff had gotten out to before. I was at a reaction, obviously. And weirdly enough, I started working on a book because of the previous magic ritual I did. I sort of, that was the big revelation there. Where I was like, oh my God, I need to, you know, one of the most important things that as a magician you're supposed to be doing is keeping a magic journal and I just wasn't doing that. And so my first book came out of me realizing in kind of an acid ritual, like, oh shit, that's what I need to be doing with my life. So I had started working on that. So, I mean, it was, it was you know, so I was working on my writing and I had actually been writing for another couple psychedelic websites and doing some music journalism. So it was like, you know, that was the point to the rituals. Like, I want to get my stuff out to a wider audience, essentially. I was more thinking the music, but the writing was there too, right? I've been doing both. And so I did it. And, and the funny thing that I could say about the ritual was a couple things. One, I mean, it was just classic psychedelic weird hallucinations that I always get completely otherworldly shit. But there was a couple moments. Like at one moment, I realized, whoa, this is going to have, what I am doing is going to have effects on a spiritual level that I don't know if I'm prepared for at all. Like, you know, it was like this realization that I am like setting something into motion here that like, and I wasn't considering that before I did it, but it was like, what I am doing is setting events into, mo uh, into motion on a psychic level that I was not considering that that was going to happen when I did this. Right. Oh, this is my totally. first like real yeah. after this one. Yeah, and I've, uh, I've the other thing that I effects of oh, like, audio mancy is kind of, you know, I'm, I'm when every time I do a kind of session of audio mancy, I will find yeah. stuff within the realm of, esotericism that totally reinforces what i saw or what i felt yeah, yeah absolutely yeah and, and the kind of music i make really it is and this is what i realized i mean i got into what i call audio sorcery when i was honestly like 18 19 years old and i started screwing around with four tracks and it was just like i was like such a weird guy who my entire obsession was like you know like most guys are like partying in girls and i'm like I'm going to make weird albums and freak myself the fuck out with them. You know, <laughs> it's just like who I was at a young age. Right. And I still have a lot of this stuff and you know, some of it. Is, so, so yeah, I mean, it, and I wasn't thinking about it lab, back then, like, Oh, I'm doing these weird audio rituals, but that's exactly what I was doing. I was doing kind of summoning rituals. This music, the design was to induce these states of consciousness, which, you know, and you know, and it was a very personal thing. Like it wasn't like I was doing this for any other reason than to just fuck with my head essentially. And to, you know, kind of, distort your perception of time. So anyways, when I finally, years later, I'm doing this in 2012. And uh, so yeah, one, I realized, oh shit, this is going to have some weird side effects that I wasn't really anticipating. And okay. And the other thing is, there was one point where I just had like this uh, experience that it was like spirits from above. And I had this vision of how they saw me, which is as this monkey going like, what the fuck? Like, what else do you want me to do? <laughs> you know, it's like, come on. Like, I've, like, you know, I, I, I think this sounds really good. Like, you know, like, you know, I, you know, it was just this bizarre like thing of like this perspective of the spirits, like in me, just like with my arms, like, come on, like how much more do I got to dance for you motherfuckers? Right. right. Um, yeah. so, so then <laughs> on one note, so I, I won't get into it too detailed, but the weird side effects that it had in my psychic life is then for the next, year and a half to two years i had well first about a week later i had this experience where this uh spirit form sidled up to me in a kind of a hypnagogic well kind of more of like a hypnagogic sleep paralysis these states and attached itself to uh you know to my my consciousness it kind of merged with my uh with my soul structure telepathically and it projected this image of this was the next step in my magic was going from um, knowledge and conversation with your holy guardian angel to then kicking it up to communion with your holy guardian angel. And then with that, it tried to pull me out. Well, it presented itself to me as my wife, like uh, my wife naked, you know, like this is a fun sexual thing. And then it tried to pull my body, uh, pull me out of my body, essentially up and up and towards the sky. And when that happened, of course, I freaked the fuck out because that sensation of getting pulled up, pulled out of your body is, is so weird and, you know, you have this perception that it shouldn't be happening. And, uh, and, and so I could never make this happen. So, this, so, that, for, so for a year, and I've written about this extensively, I was having this constant experience after I did this ritual of these spirit forms trying to show me, you know, like almost like the straight up alien abduction shit. Like, 
Yeah, communion with your holy angel. We pull you out of your body. And they presented it themselves to me as a bunch of different weird figures. You know, uh, sometimes it was kind of hilarious because it was like girls that I sort of had a crush on and wasn't really acknowledging to myself, you know, like mm. things like that. And, and so it was, you think but they are, was like weird. Wit- they are like internal projections? Yeah, I mean, clearly they're like reading your thoughts. You know, and okay, but like, they are yeah. like outside beings. Oh yeah, yeah, not, yeah. Not no, these you. things are trying to trying to pull me out of my body. And and what's so fucked up about this is it finally stopped happening after a while, and then I'd forgotten why, and I realized that I was actually shown after a while. And what they showed is that these things were sort of like just as scared of me as I was of them. Oh. And that's why it didn't really work. So yeah, which was a really weird and, and even more bizarre thought is that part of what was going wrong is that when I first start freaking out, it freaks them out. And, and you know, again, I was sort of reassured that, uh, <laughs> that that's not a big deal, but, now, um, and so this anyways, was, that this was, my- was the LS, the first LSD ritual. Um, yeah, so this is my first LSD ritual and the we, okay. Yeah, no, and this ties back to this info. This is why I'm telling the story. I'm not just going on a super long tangent, oh, no, which totally. I sort of am. It's a long story. <laughs> uh, but the spirit, spiritual me. So anyways, so I did this ritual. And then, um, weirdly enough, like an interview to that band uh, did ended up, end up uh, get airing on disinfo.com. And then later that year, literally a week after December 20th, 2012, disinfo picked up my writing. And my writing did, in fact, get it got out to a way bigger audience. So that was my... And it's literally like a week after December 20th, 2012. Like all my... So I did this weird 2012 acid ritual and then right on cue, exactly what I was asking for was sort of answered for me in a way. Um, so that's actually the story of how I ended up writing a disinfo. Of course, I wouldn't have kept doing it if people didn't like what I was doing and I was getting a great reaction, but... But yeah, yeah, so that that's the story. I know what you mean about the December 21st, 2012 woo-woo that yeah. was going on. Um, but it's something incredible happened to me as well, but I wouldn't classify it as anything other than a shift in consciousness, you know, mm-hmm. an internal yeah. one. But um, we'll, I want to get back to the audiomancy stuff or audio yeah. sorcery stuff you, you yeah, talked yeah. about. Yeah, yeah, it's not often that I talk to other bit. people that are into this. But. Yeah, no, it's, yeah. It's, it's been kind of the most natural practice I've ever had. It was born out of sheer curiosity, not uh, influenced by anything else, and it's only been uh, able to kind of see the parallels in other people's you know, writings and esotericism and stuff that I, I've discovered that I'm tapping into something that's not just an inner, you know? Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. So and, did, you know, that is, did, I'm sorry. So, did, so, so back to 2012, too, and I hope anyway, like, there's a lot of people that are still like that. So I, I realize it, but what I've always said about it is, one, this is a personal thing that I did, and two, um, I've always said that, you, if there was some kind of shift of consciousness is going to happen, like you can't look at it like 10 years after the fact. Oh, totally. Years. Like perception of time moves so much slower on the other hand. I mean, like from what I've seen about the spirit realm, they are looking at things like, you know, a hundred years is nothing to them. I would say you'd have to look at a sheer, a sheer hundred years afterwards in 3012 to, to actually to really understand yeah. whether something happened. And on that front, I think that a mere like four or five years after 2012 and say 2016 or so, all of a sudden everybody was like, what the fuck is going on? And, and also in 2012, the other thing that people don't mention is entirely true that this was the first victory in the drug war and that marijuana was made legal in Washington and uh, Colorado in right. uh, November of 2012. So uh, again, if we look back a hundred years and we can say that was the start when weed was legalized of a weird psychedelic revolution that took a hundred years to finally progress and have the human species evolve to a higher state of consciousness, start evolving to a higher state of consciousness. Um, you know, maybe so. so yeah. Anyways. I I read that you mentioned once, uh, I think I wrote it down. You had said that you could go into how I've repeatedly been shown how demonic or reptilian entities control humanity with narcotics and booze. Um, and I'd love to, dig more into that uh especially because i'm a yeah. ex addict i guess i could say mm-hmm. um and yeah i've always i've always thought that it was a numbing of the psychic self that was the the whole yeah. point i think i think it is a numbing of the psychic self and you know you you being a, a former addict and that's the the funny the funny thing with me is i was never really an addict i was you know what you would say 
a dangerous binge drinker, <laughs> you know, okay. yeah. and, and, and I've done my share of pills as well. And, and I do think, and this is something, cause I, I never quit drinking, but I absolutely, well, for, I, I could go into this straight up. Like I was started having dreams and, you know, uh, one of the, uh, the, the things that I, I'm, I'm most known for is, is keeping a live dream vision journal on, on uh, social media and yeah, I've kept I records of a lot of this. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, I had a repeated series of dreams that are basically just showing me these weird themes of the drug war and relating it to kind of, uh, uh, kind of, you know, the darker kind of demonic forces that are controlling reality. And it's like, I wasn't watching shows about this shit, you know, I wasn't uh, feeling from yeah. an external level, my consciousness. And yet this, this theme just like kept showing up. Yeah, I was going to ask if there were outside, I was going to ask if there were any outside influences or uh, any outside yeah. things you were looking into that might have dove into no. that, but no, it sounds completely transmitted. No, and exactly, and that's what was particularly weird about it. If you're if you're right, I mean, in in if I was like watching shows about the drug war or something, or you know, or, or even like you know, just fiction TV shows, or you know, sure, this would make perfect sense. But I wasn't doing that at all. <laughs> like this, I was just having these weird visions, and and just in a general sense, and there's another like completely weird thing about me and Booth. And, and, uh, and so when I first started practicing, uh, magic and this is God, 2006, essentially. Uh, and when I first started, uh, being in this band, I, I was consumed with this weird idea that I could like conquer alcohol, right? <laughs> like it's like complete. And it's, and so these things corresponded, right. And, and like, and it was, and, it, and I look back and it's just like, I'm not sure like, you know, it really does seem like it was this weird test. And I don't know, like, why I was suddenly, like, because I, you know, I've been trying to get away from partying for years. And suddenly when I started practicing magic, I was like, I can, like, beat alcohol. I can learn to be a really productive, fucking amazing drunk, right? And, <laughs> Drink through you know, the other well, side. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, I'm going to be, and, and, and I, I, I fully aware that this was um, uh, partially inspired by people like Hunter S. Thompson and I'm sure. kind of Robert Pollard. And, you know, and, oh, and, Guided by Voices? Yeah, 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 absolutely. <laughs> Huge Robert Pollard fan. Yeah, yeah, total drunk. And, and both these guys are very productive, productive artists that drink. And I was like, I can do that. You know, I'm going to use booze to help me be productive. And it worked. And I did it for like four years. I was drinking, you know, and this is after years of drinking before that. But like, I was really like, man, and you know, and it's like, I would drink all my fluids. And like, I, you know, literally, I like looked at it as a science. Like, I am going to learn how to operate when I'm like wasted drunk all the time. time. And I did a completely amazing job of doing that. And I really do think that you're <laughs> keep tapping into this like complete, like dark, weird energy and i've been shown this specifically that there is like this weird vibe of of you know drug energy that is fueling our society and god i've been shown just recently a couple of this and so this is what i'm getting at is like how much of our behavior is you know controlled by things like alcohol and booze and so the end story of this me doing this for like four years while i was in black science is like it completely blew up in my face and at one point i was essentially i started having a lot of crazy like the demonic attacks like straight up where it was like evil entities were invading my headspace and attacking me and they were explaining to me straight up it's like dude if you didn't drink we wouldn't be able to do this you know it was and that was sort of the point is they were trying to point that out to me it's like we're actually doing this to get you to stop drinking <laughs> you know it's like the reason we're being so harsh and fucking with you is because we're just like we're trying to make it so unpleasant that you finally fucking stop what you're doing so it was like it was nice to believe and so it was weird like i was manipulated into this weird thing where uh, you know it's like your dad gives you a whole pack of fucking smokes you know it's like you know oh you, you had one cigarette you're gonna smoke the whole pack like it was like that sort of weird experience where it was like oh you're gonna master alcohol and be a productive drunk and what ended up happening is i got my ass completely fucking kicked by alcohol and my body gave out yeah and, and it is so funny because it is like you know, I, you don't think about this when you're getting older, but it's like, you know, with like athletes, essentially a lot of times, you know, great athlete, great athlete around age 35 or so, like, bam, they can't play anymore. Right. This is what, this is what happened to the party. Essentially. It was like, I mean, I was like, I could fucking rock it and drink beer all fucking day and get a ton of shit done. And then bam, like, no, your body can't handle that shit at all anymore. And, and I can't say enough how fucking difficult that was emotionally to deal with. <laughs> like, like that is not an easy thing, man. Like getting over drugs. Well, just like actually changing your life, you know, it's like, it, 
And that's what I can say was, I mean, this is why I mean, it's a warning to anybody. It's like, I've cleaned my shit up. I've, I've even, I've been like one of the few lucky people that I still do drink, uh, but it's only like two or three drinks once or twice a week. But, you know, I can't, I haven't, I can't, it's basically the drink between the difference between having some drinks every now and again and partying. And I finally got there and I so rarely ever get out of control. So it's lucky because I never did want to give it up. But like, holy fuck, if you thought it was easy to get to that point, like you're insane. Like, and I, like, and, and from an emotional level, that's what I don't think like people get. Like, it was really like you, you probably struggled with worse drug addiction. For me, it was like this weird, like emotional thing that, you know, especially being a musician and stuff like being a partier was like so much of my personality and like really just like giving that up. And yeah, I did have those days where it's like, you could like feel the alcohol, like just fucking calling to you, you know, I used to drink in the day, like every Saturday. And like some days, I mean, when I was getting over that, there'd be days I'd get up and it's just like, Oh my God, like I want to, yeah. <laughs> so, I'm still trying amazing. to rectify the last 10 years of being a musician, uh, you know, touring and, and just that lack of security, lack of discipline, uh, but yeah. completely in the moment, like living for those, you know, minutes a day. And that's, that's what happened on the other minutes was filling that void in between. <laughs> but yeah. 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 I no, and, it's un- and it's unfortunate too, because, you know, uh, you know, we are so enculturated into this shit. When I talk about, you know, we were just talking about society being run by, you know, alcohol and, you know, it's like as musicians, you're basically, especially when you're on a smaller level, you're basically a fucking booze salesman. I mean, that's no, sort of like, what you're doing. Oh, totally. Yeah. I just yeah. released an and, and album and was like, you know, I'm, I'm going to do everything in my power to not do the bar circuit. Not for any other reason than I don't want to participate in that, in that whole, uh, you know, uh, economic structure. <laughs> no, I agree completely. And, it, you know, and they got a, we need, this is one thing. I don't even know how, how good it is in Colorado at this point, but like, why don't we have weed clubs? Like that is like the one thing I'm like, why aren't there clubs where people can like buy and, and smoke weed while you're playing? Like oh, I if I was did. going to be, uh, we don't in Seattle. I mean, the funny thing about Seattle. Oh, is, right. Like, you're in Seattle. You know, I'm in Portland. That's I, I confuse the two. Do sometimes. you have weed clubs already there? Like, I, we, we still are. We must. I mean, huh. I don't know. Yeah. I'm, we I don't, don't have that in Seattle. It's been legal since like 2012. We, we never passed laws allowing that. I think what's funny is there's always DIY clubs where you play and no, I mean, people could just smoke, but oh, yeah. I've never been to like, I've never been to a venue. God, even one of the, like the best clubs in Seattle that finally sadly closed the fun house. Like they always had a back porch where like, they never gave a talk about people blazing up back there. Yeah, so, I it was are like, you, so are you still using uh, weed for your shamanistic Endeavors? Oh yeah, no, absolutely. I never gave up weed. In fact, I'm still a huge stoner. And, and that's, yeah, no, in fact, uh, uh, the kind of magic that, that I practice is very weed based, you know, it's like that is the primary means by which I, I, I use, uh, I, I use to create an altered state of consciousness. And, and I think, uh, you know, uh, I talk about his gongitation. Um, yeah, I mean, definitely like a lot of this gongitation. Yeah. A lot of the stuff that I channel, I have a very weed based shamanic practice you know and i think because of that you know what i have to do what i the kind of magic i do is it really does have kind of more in common with shamanism than it does uh, with the occult but it, it's not shamanism either so it's like you know it's like it's like shamanism has such an association with nature and going out into the natural world and like that is not my practice is more about merging with art rather than nature so you know yeah it, there's just a fundamental difference there uh it, it, so yeah i mean there's definitely more of a an occult feel to what i do but yeah no i, I I'm, I'm a total fucking stoner i'm like I'm, <laughs> I'm one of those people too that it's just like if you're if you ever see me it's just like are you high and it's just like well i'm at work well, then the answer is yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm not at work, I'm high. Like, if you see me and I'm not at work, uh, I'm high. You see, yeah, weed is the one pretty... thing where the one drug that always affected me the, the most. And it was, it still is the hardest one. Like, I, I have to treat it ritualistically. Um, yeah, yeah. To do it, because it just, it hits those levels real quickly for me. <laughs> yeah, so what, what do you mean when it hits those levels? Like, you get really tripped out or well yeah i would say tripped out but more introverted more heavy um yeah like a psychic weight you know where i need to be Mm -hmm. on my own to just have an exit strategy for everything (laughs) not be (laughs) cornered in even you know with company 
Um, yeah. But yeah, it's it, that's the funny thing to me is you know I've done a lot of a lot of dumb stuff in my life, and weed has always been the the hardest one to get into. I'm appreciative of that though because I treat it seriously. You know, I, I yeah, treat yeah. it ritualistically. But, you know, the one thing I was actually, it, it's actually very weird because I mean, the thing about me and I didn't even fully, wasn't fully aware of this, like until I started like writing about magic for this info is that, you know, God, what I do is so, so different. Cause it's a very weed based, you know, like I said, it's a very weed based practice. And I was never, you know, I, I talk a lot about how I have a lot of psychic experiences and things that I've channeled where I have strong evidence that it lines up to reality. And I can actually, I have like lots of examples now of things where I'm like, okay, here's this thing that I wrote about in 2014. And then two years later, this is exactly what happened. And like, explain that shit, you know? And a lot of it, there's really, and you know, and it's one, it's like one or two of those be coincidence. I'm at the point where I have like seven or eight of those that can be like completely verified. And, and I always talk about how I was summoned into the occult and, and, and that is what happened. Like I was at this really low point in my life and, um, and some fucking shrouded entity showed up in my room and uh, kind of clapped its hands twice the way a hypnotist would awaken a subject. And I bolted out of bed and I suddenly realized that for like a decade of my life, I was in complete denial about the fact that, you know, I had kind of like, uh, greater psi abilities than most people. And I was kind of running away and afraid of those abilities. And I needed to embrace them because it was sort of like, like D, you can use this. This is a good thing. Like you're running away from being a fucking space wizard when being a space wizard is awesome. Right. And, and so, and, and immediately after that, and part of that too, is I needed to start practicing magic. And I started doing kind of like rudimentary sigil, sigil exercise the very next day. So it was this weird thing that happened. And, you know, uh, I don't have any proof that a shrouded entity showed up in my room and like snapped its fingers and uh, turned it, you know, uh, yeah, 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 exactly. But what I can say is there is some evidence in the fact that I am a guy that like, Everything who writes about like magic and channeling spirits and shit like this and doing spells like 2012, you know, ritual acid rituals and shit. And, you know, I have like two books out that could be filed in, you know, the occult genre. And I've, I, I have never been attracted to any part of that culture whatsoever. Like, you know, and so how does that happen? How does some guy that's not into the culture that's associated with the occult at all suddenly randomly start writing about this, you know, start writing books about this kind of shit. So again, there's no proof, but there is that. There's like most people that are into the occult, like have a fascination and attraction to that side of the culture. And then it's like, I don't at all. <laughs> like, I, like I, I was summoned into this shit. That's why I'm writing about it. Not because like I thought it was cool or anything like that. In fact, I, I generally, I'm more of a psychedelic kind of weird guy. I'm not really a goth guy at all. Like never oh, happened. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, because it seems I've noticed, you know, towards the end of Disinfo, I'd, I'd like to get into just in the uh, like sure. public eye and the and the occult renaissance or, you know, neo-occult yeah. renaissance that's happening right now. I've noticed just a, an extreme divide in um, practitioners, you know. Uh, the, yeah. the big thing, too, I've noticed that your work particularly seems divisive. Oh yeah, 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 definitely. And I, uh, yeah, I can't no. put my finger on why. I, I think it, you think I. I think maybe it's like because you dip into some political areas. Am I close? Oh, that... abso absolutely. Yeah, yeah. no, absolutely, it's political areas. And yeah, I, I, I sort of lost my train of thought and where I was going uh, with, with talking about yeah being summoned in the occult, which I thought was like this weird thing. Like, how does like I get something? You know, someone get something in the occult, and yet. I did, in fact, start playing around with astral projection when I was, like, 18 years old because, like, I psychedelics blew my mind and, like, it's just something my mom was into and got me into, and that was completely fucking weird. Plus, I was smoking pot, like, all the time. And so it was this combination, and, and weirdly enough, of course, like, pot-based kind of sex magic shit, too, like, psychedelic sex magic combined with astral projection, and that's what fucking, you know, the occult is, you know, the, the tradition of combining astral projection with weed and the idea that you can use weed to intensify astral projection is it, like that is an occult thing. So this thing happened where I get something in the occult and it seems weird to me because culturally that's like not my, my jam at all. And yet, uh, and yet somehow it is like, oh yeah, but you did in fact start playing around with astral projection. 
projection and using weed as something to aid after projection for like a decade before that happened. So I guess it's not really, you were sort of doing this shit. You just mm-hmm. weren't thinking about it that way at all. You do um, seem to so, have like a, uh, you know, a, uh, an authoritative idea about the occult though. You um, know? Well, you know, I, I, if I was, so yeah, first of all, as far as my stuff being divisive, yeah. And, and, you know, what's weird about that too, is I've just written, uh, you know, probably two of my most popular pieces, uh, are just me talking about how I don't like EA Ketting. That's, or, I was um, going to bring that one up too. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and and that is the one thing about this info dying because the whole site got taken down, and I, it's like, man, I was right. I was getting people like messaging me about shit I wrote like three years ago over there. Like people were still finding this. I don't know. So that is the sort of a definitely sad thing about it. Thing now at the same time, so I was very critical. Yeah, no, I mean I'm very critical of the kind of embracing darkness and spookiness uh, era of the occult. It's not only never real, and again, if that's your thing from an aesthetic perspective. I'm fine with it. And, and another thing that I would, so yeah, so yes, my stuff is divisive and it's partially just the nature of the goddamn internet because yeah, when I write I was something say. like, yeah, it's the nature of internet and social media, you know, it's like that shit works. Part of the reason that I'm known for that shit is like, those are the two most popular things I did. Like, and it's so funny. I still had people like, you know, I did like troll Crowley and, you know, I, cause, and why did I keep doing it? And people rightfully call me out for doing it, you know? And, and I'm just laughing. I'm like, if every time, I, like literally, if I really wanted to get the site hits up on Disinfo, I would have just done that every fucking week because it never didn't work. Like every single time you did a post about Crowley being a douchebag, it would get a bunch of hits. Like every single time. And I found that out the weird way. I did that post and I swear to God, that's what like maxed out my friends and my friends on Facebook. And I didn't even realize that got posted when I was in this period where I wasn't even looking at social media because I was like really focused on finishing this book I was working on. And like, yeah, I logged in my social media account. I was like, what the? fuck <laughs> you know it was like holy shit like yeah and, so, and there were so, people but, critical of that piece or the people agreeing about the anti um people people well both equally yeah i mean obviously there's a million hate comments and then there's a million people asking me my friends people are still reading it to this you know till just recently when it was probably taken down so yeah i mean i was sort of getting egged on and you know there's part of me that's like you know yeah i mean oh, fuck, that's what you like okay but i do think there is a greater point and and where I would distance myself from, well, I mean, first of all, if I was going to be critical, well, again, I came to this stuff in the astral projection. So for, the, for me, this is spirit work, right? Like I'm putting myself into trance states and I'm fucking projecting myself to the outer reaches of the astral plane. And I'm bringing back information and tr- that I, I think will be that. That is what the occult is to me. Even basic things, like as I've gone on, like the idea that, you know, you're, you're making causing change in conformance with your will like ah, it's not really what i've been shown i've been sort of shown that really this shit's controlling you you're not like <laughs> you know it's like you're tapping into forces that are way bigger than you and sort of letting them control you and take control of the scene like i don't think you're controlling shit like i really think that's like a very ego maniacal way of looking at it and that's just sort of, sort of what i've been shown but you know i mean so so my stuff is about spirit work and channeling my books are not like how to instruction manuals about how to do rituals. They're shit that I've channeled. I write channeled books, you know? So what, what I do is completely different than what other people there are doing. And, you know, it's like, it's not even the same thing. And, and as far as why I write, write about like the, the, the dark side of magic and stuff like this, man, I've, I've been doing this shit for fucking years now. And it's like, would you, if you were going to um, give your kid a fucking car, are you going to like tell your kid like, Hey, you can kill people with this and you can kill yourself. Or do you just throw the keys to your car, the, the keys to your kid and say, you know, do whatever the fuck you want. I'm not into shooting guns, but like <laughs> if you are a gun enthusiast and you're teaching a teenager, like, Hey, here's how you go out and shoot guns during your honey. Do you tell them that you can kill people with that gun and that you can kill yourself and show them gun safety or you just throw them a gun and say, do whatever the fuck you want. That's so funny. Um, yeah. I was, ju- I just used an, that analogy in a, my last interview with Robert Powell. And I said, oh, nice. you know, it's a lot like, uh, you know, these new gurus or these, especially these YouTube gurus like EA Coetting or whatever, uh, are basically selling fully loaded automatic guns painted like toys. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and 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 again, this this stuff, and I never like I I I came in like my 
I was I, I was joking also that I'm kind of more a comic book occultist, you know, rather than like a horror movie occultist. You know? Sure, yeah. I mean, <laughs> so it's like the Grand Morrison. Like people want to be curly. Really. I want to be fucking Doctor Strange, man. Like that. Exactly. That's, yeah. I want to like you know my, the, the idea that you're supposed to use these this magic for good. But anyways, yeah. I mean. So what's so funny is like I I also by the way like the article I wrote about Curly like honestly cursed me to a certain extent because then like anytime I mentioned open social media for like the next eight months it'd be like people asking me questions about Alex fucking Curly and shit and I'm like dude, the thing is like I'm not a fan of that guy <laughs> like so now it's like I'm spending all my time talking about this thing that I'm not actually a fan of which was sort of a pet fuck uh, but eventually and so I was always going to do rituals so like you know like oh god I'm so sick of talking about Alex Curly at this point um, but uh, I was sort of sort of in the spirit realm it's like no you need to talk about him and you need to talk about him from from the spiritual perspective and that if i had to distance myself for all the criticism and man it was a lot including scathing reviews of my book and shit like that for the curly piece you know it, 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 it was it was pretty pretty high level trolling but my entire thesis to that piece and if i was going to say what where i really separate myself from the occult is exactly this the thesis to that piece was that Comet magic and things like sorcery work because all consciousness connected. And the most important thing that you need to consider when you're getting into this stuff is karma, right? And how your actions are going to influence reality and what the larger impact is on, on reality. And, and, you know, and, and that this is in, that's the most important thing because the reason magic works is because consciousness, can, consciousness is connected. We're all connected and not, we're not just connected from what I've been shown to one another, but we're connected to like everything, you know, this entire level of reality is there's a connectivity of consciousness, which is exactly why magic works and synchronicity works and stuff like that. So my entire theory is that Aleister Crowley was completely fucking irresponsible in his use of magic, which is undeniable. He is somebody... He is somebody. He is, a, he is somebody who did not believe in these concepts, and he ruined his fucking life with magic. So he is not somebody that we should put on a pedestal and look up to. He is actually a great example of what not to do with magic, and you know, to do magic with zero con- with zero regard to consequences. You know, you selfish ego ego maniacal magic to curse people all the time. This is the exact thing you don't want to do. Nobody. None of the comments that I read. I read so many negative comments on these pieces. Not one even addressed that. And that was the central fucking thesis of the piece. And so if that is, if that I think sums up the distance between me and other occultists in a nutshell. And there's a, there's an interesting follow-up to that story. Cause like I said, I wrote that. I was away from social media. I didn't even realize the crazy reaction it got to like a month later. And, uh, then later, <laughs> later, um, um, on Easter Sunday, which is only a couple months after that got posted, I think I got February and Easter was like it was April or May. Uh, on Easter Sunday, my wife was like, hey, you want to go to the thrift store? And so I was like, yeah, what's fuck? So we went to the thrift store on Easter Sunday and I found a used copy of the book of Abramel and the Mage at a thrift store. I had no intention of reading this book. I was just like, you know, the book of Abramel and the Mage was not something that was on my reading list. And yet when you randomly find it at a bookstore on Easter Sunday, you're like, okay, cool. I'm going, apparently I'm going to read the book of Abramel and the Mage. When I did, the thing that shocked me, and I'd sort of known this in the books I've read about Crowley, but I'd never read the book itself. What shocked me the most about reading that book is that there's one thing Abramelin wants you to know is that you, that the most important thing about magic is that if you don't do it with the good of the greater, the, good of the greater whole in mind, it is going to backfire on you. If you don't consider the wider rear course of your action, and if you're doing it for selfish reasons, if you're not doing it to elevate the whole of humanity, then it is going to backfire on you. He says this over and over and over and over and over again. If there is one thing that he wants you to know about magic, it's like, Yes, you have to be doing this with pure intention. This has to be for the right reasons. This has to be to help the greater whole of humanity because they are you. And Curly, co- Curly completely read that. And he was like, eh, but I want to use magic to be a selfish asshole. And he lived a horribly painful life despite being famous, got addicted to every drug imaginable. He's a richest to rag story. You know, he died poor with the whole country, country hating him, you know, you know, and so like, he was a miserable fucking asshole, sociopathic human being. And even he wondered near the end of his life before multiple sources, like, huh, maybe I should have listened to a Brumlin. Yes, <laughs> this is my point. And again, I wrote again about this and it's just like, and this is something that most people that are involved in occult circles, like just don't want to hear. 
And you know what? I don't want to be judgy about it. I really do think that a lot of people uh, uh, that get into that kind of side of things are have a very negative experience with the church. I think a lot of there's a lot of abuse there. But, um, you know, uh, my point is I played in a metal band for years and uh, I intentionally in this band, like I played this very angry persona that ranted about like politics and shit. And, you know, it wasn't good for my mental health. <laughs> in fact, it almost killed me. You know, you are the art you create and who you are. And I think there's a cathartic nature that you can find in the in, in really embracing the dark side and the negative in your life. But but ultimately, you got to be really careful with that shit. Not only that, you can fuck your shit up with magic, and that's my that's my, you can in fact fuck your life up with magic, just like you can with a car or a gun. And you shouldn't just go around doing it recklessly. You really shouldn't. Like it's not a good idea. Like I. I'm talking from experience. Like, I definitely think I'd probably fuck some things up. And, 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 you know, and, 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 and weirdly enough, in my sense, it's the things that have been fucked up that have been designed to help other people. That's what's like, there's like the purest intentions of all. And yet it's like, I was sort of warned that that wasn't a great idea and I didn't listen. But yeah. What are you going to do? This here Prag Magic Podcast is brought to you by Portland, Oregon's Open Source Art Religion and Prag Magic Art Collective, We the Hallowed. For more information, please visit wethehallowed.org or support these fine, pious individuals at patreon.com slash wethehallowed. Remember, that's hallowed like saintly. H-A-L-L-O-W-E-D. Thank you. And do you do you practice any kind of uh, you know academic or old um, tradition or devotion? Um, not really. Yeah, I mean, unless I guess on the primal level, the tradition of using weed to uh, to accentuate uh, astral projection. Yeah, then yes, that and right. using you know in 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 hypnagogia. Too. Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, basic, and, and this is what's so amazing about this is in even more academic circles, the potentiality of hypnagogy and, and, and tapping into the liminal states of consciousness due, between awake and sleep. Um, yeah, I mean, these are, these are in fact ancient practices, but from the more traditional sense, like most of my, most of the stuff that I do is, is more visual exercise, you know, visualization exercises. And it really is more internal and it comes from spirit communication and reading dreams and visions. So in a way you're right, that is an ancient tradition, but as far as like, do I read a bunch of ancient books like and, and try and invoke goetic demons? No, I, I don't do any of that stuff, but communicating with ancient demons, I do. Yeah, I was <laughs> that that you, I do. You seem, you seem like natural. It was a natural wave. You said you were called to it. So I was wondering if you ever saw any parallels in other, you know, works that uh, I know well, Cosmic you know Trigger is an obvious one that comes to Yeah, mind. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And things like Cosmic Trigger uh, in the works of Grant Morrison, absolutely. Oh, totally. Um, but you're right. From the, from the standpoint that I really do come at this from, yeah, and you're right. I, I think there's a part of me where, and I, and I think there's something about magic that, you know, I, I, and I can say straight up about, say, the military remote, remote viewing programs and whatnot, is that with those, absolutely, like, and this is something that frustrates people, is that some people do just have these abilities, they are just sort of better. I think it's something that everyone can develop. But I do think that, you know, some people just sort of have this abilities. And then there's people like myself and Graham Morrison, if I had to say that there's one thing in common between us, it's that both of us started playing around with weird esoteric spiritual practices that, that most people never play with when we were very young, like Graham Morrison started doing kind of weird, you know, uh, Crowley, uh, ritualistic magic when he was like a teenager. And I started playing around with astral projection as a teenager. So it, it's a weird thing. And that's not something that a lot of people start getting into at a young age. And, you know, after years, you know, like I said, I was in denial about it for about a decade. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, no, um, it, the more the point though is like the book Cosmic Trigger is actually sort of about the combination in a way. And so is the book Supernatural by Graham Hancock that like this info put out years back. It's about the combination between the similarities between like alien contact phenomenon and, uh, you know, shamanic initiation rites and, and like Cosmic Trigger explores a lot of like the similarities. Like, you know, this idea that you can, that Grant Morrison popularized through this info.com that you can contact you know, extra dimensional forms of intelligence through sex magic. Um, 
and, and but, but that's what's find it interesting. Like I read a lot of stuff about the occult, and like if you ask me to like recommend you a cult blog, and stuff, and it's like weirdly enough, I have more in common with like alien contactees. There's a there's a podcast I used to listen to called Paratopia years ago, and like when I listen to like you know I guess it's from the astral projection side. These stories about like these utterly bizarre encounters with these unknown forms of intelligence and like how that manifests in, in these people's lives who, by the way, aren't doing magic at all. Like that is like, that's more relatable to me <laughs> than most of what I read in magic circles. Like I have more in common with like alien contact T people because like, that's how weird my life is, you know? But anyways, listen, when I say I was summoned into magic by like a weird entity with, uh, you know, a weird shrouded entity that unhypnotized me, like, I'm not just saying that that's what fucking happened, man. And <laughs> yeah, when I say I did acid rituals in 2012 and then my writing got picked up like right after 2012, like, and, and I went through a year long period where weird spirit entities were pulling me out of my body and projecting sexual images into me to try and co coax me out of my body. Like that, you know, that's my reality. That's what I deal with. So, you know, and, and I have a, a lot of respect for like alien, you know, especially the people that come out and talk about this because it's a very similar experience of like, yeah, this is considered utterly nuts by our culture. <laughs> and yet I'm here to tell you, it's not crazy. It's always been here. There have always been people like me and people like these people saying this exact same shit. It doesn't matter where you point out in a history book. It, it, it's a fundamental aspect of the human condition that's always going to be here and it's, it's never going to go away. So from that standpoint, you can say it's crazy, but I'm not crazy, man. You know, no, I, had totally a, I, I, I intentionally got hey, you made a living off of it. You know? You can't, that? Be, you can't be crazy. You made a living off of it. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I don't. <laughs> yeah, I know. Oh, man. Yeah, I know. <laughs> if you actually think I make money doing what I do, oh. yeah, not, no, not really I was, at all. I was totally kidding. Uh, yeah, no. but I, I wish I did, man. Yeah. And hopefully don't we someday all? I'll make a living off it. Because that's how we know, that's how everyone knows we're telling the truth is when we make money. <laughs> Well, it is so joke. funny, though, that you, you get that with magic, and there's inherent with spiritual identity. Like, you will get that argument, you know? Like, yeah. If you're, if you're magic work, you'd be a millionaire. <laughs> you know? I know, it's, it's like, ridiculous. No, well, actually, it's about a spiritual progression, and I think in most cases, you making a lot of money would probably deaden that. <laughs> like, I, I really do. Yeah. You know? Well, I wanted to touch on, you know, you talked about the HGA, and I just... Before we wrap up, I'm I'm yeah. interested in seeing if you had any. I know your your practice is so personal and it's so natural. Yeah. Um, but has there been anything that you thought you should write down that might be um, able to transpose to other people to maybe get to that communion with the HGA? About how to make that happen. Um, yeah, well, steps and this is to get in there. You know? Steps to getting there. I mean, the basics of sigil, I mean, the main thing I can say is that the further in I've gone, well, one, uh, absolutely, try Robert Monroe's techniques for astral projection. <laughs> like, I'm, like, try it. Like, that's what seemingly, you know, I tried that. And, and, and if, if, for people that don't really know what this is, is you're intentionally inducing a sleep paralysis state. Like, that is what you're doing. And he has this thing called hemisick technology that um, – it's it's basically it's kind of like binaural beats it's designed to kind of like synchronize the temples of the brain and i, I started playing around since 18 years old and it absolutely works you're inducing these weird sleep paralysis states and when i was in those states i kept having these experiences where it was like there was entities there that were then controlling my dreams and communicating to me in the dream world and this is why there's so much sleep paralysis there's so much like literature out there with scientists be like we've solved it it's happening because of this and you never hear the side of the story it's like people have been doing this on purpose for years and i challenge anybody hey read some of my books and see how weird this gets like no it's <laughs> this isn't just like the weird hallucination I've, you're literally sort of forced to deal with the idea that yeah it definitely seems like you can humans can have essentially have this ability to sort of separate their souls into weird other altered states of consciousness through this process of uh, intentionally inducing these vibrational states. Wow. And so, yeah, try that, you know, that if, yeah. if you wanted from advice, heard, try that. I've never heard of yeah. in, it like inducing sleep paralysis. I've experienced, I mean, I experienced it multiple times a month sometimes, but uh, I've yeah. always known about sleep deprivation and, and things like that. But sleep paralysis, that's, that makes a lot of sense to me. 
Yeah, no, I'd look into it. Yeah, and I would recommend anybody. Robert Monroe has three books, and I would recommend. And, he, and that's the thing is, like, you can buy his tapes, and it's so funny. I have four of these, and some people it's like, I don't know, it's like eighty bucks to get them at this point. I mean, it used to be way more expensive, but you can like download the shit for like eighty bucks. And I've even had some people being like, oh, that's this must be a decent bag of weed, you know? It's like seriously, you like this is something that will fuck you up as much as you want to fuck you up as long as you have it, you know? So, and definitely read his books because there's a level of like, sort of like just suggesting that you can do this kind of thing, you know? And, and it's just the way consciousness works in, in general. It's like this power of suggestion. It's so, it's so fascinating. And this is part of why I did this is like, you know, I had my mind blown the fact that psychedelics and you're like talking to like my mom who's square as fuck. And yet she played around with these tapes when she was younger. And so I, she gave me the books and he talks about in, you know, entering the sleep, the sleep paralysis state and just that power of suggestion, like this can happen. It happened to me that night, which is part of the reason. So it was like, huh, this sounds like a crazy batshit thing. And yet just the power of suggestion when I first read the book and then it happened, I woke up in that state that night and it was like, oh, okay, well, clearly this guy isn't just completely making up shit here because exactly what he said would happen. And the only reason I mentioned that is because that's not uncommon. I've not seen a decent amount of articles on sleep paralysis. And like this guy made a movie about it, like a really weird spooky horror movie. And I've now seen a lot of people like commenting saying the exact same shit. It's like, I saw something about this and then it happened to me that day. So like, that's not, so it's, it's just fascinating. And this is like aspects of consciousness, like hypnosis that we just conveniently ignore how weird and malleable, you know, human consciousness actually is. So yeah, I would, I recommend reading the guy's books and, and playing around with his tapes. Um, other things, you know, man, I mean, the more I've gotten into magic, uh, yeah, like learning how to master the hypnagogic state. And I, of course, use marijuana and often sex in conjunction with this. And, you know, it's, it's incredibly a simple process. And I, I talk about this in, uh, yeah, I don't really see anybody talking about this process, but this is a, pre, it's a pretty basic process. It's basic sigil shit, right? You know, and it's so hilarious too, because like, we're so uptight as a society about the sexual aspect of it, but like, like, like I'm a fucking human male. Like, I'm not going to pretend that I, you know, like beat off before I go to sleep every night anyway. So like, you know, like, sorry, like why? And this is what, when I first started getting into magic, when you struggle with this, it's like, why the fuck are we so uptight about sex? Like the sexual aspect of it was preventing me from trying it for so long until I got summoned into it. Cause I sort of read, it. like I'd read like the disinfo book of lies when I got summoned into it. But the whole time I'm like, this stuff is kind of creepy. You know, like, I'm not honestly going to do that. You know, part of it is the sex. And then, and yeah, so like on one side, it's like, that's, that's kind of weird and creepy. And then on the other side, it's like, oh, let me watch more porn, you know, like, <laughs> it's what you were doing anyway, you know, like this idea that you're just like, oh, that's creepy to like, have sex and think about something other than sex, you know, right. so I mean, there's the that, whole idea. That communion of two, you know, entities coming together and hitting that state is like, there's just nothing else, nothing else like that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And, and God, one of my crazier stories, and this has only happened once in my life, but I did induce, and this is in my first first book, if anyone wants to read about it, called uh, The Galactic Dialogue of Cult Initiations, where I was like less than a year after I'd actually started pray, uh, practicing magic. But one of the things that happened very quickly is that I met who, the woman who ended up uh, becoming my wife and who I've now been with, God, we're coming up on our 10th anniversary. We've been together like 12 years at this point. Um, yeah, and so that's like one of the first things that happened when I started, you know, practicing magic. It was like we were just like drawn together, and I was at a really pathetic point in my life, uh, and that's what that's what sort of pulled me out of it. Was like, you know, and that's a, so, but but <laughs> that's part of the weird thing about it. But the other weird aspect of it about it is on my birthday, and this is like a year after I started practicing magic, or like six months. I had this weird dream where it was this entity explaining to me that I was a latest incarnation of some kind of weird demonic God. And then it like, like the emperor in, in star Wars, my brother didn't believe that this was the case. And then like the emperor, it shot these kind of weird bolts of electricity into me. And then and the other funny thing about this dream is like the second it said the word of this entity that I was like, I knew it immediately. There was this understanding. And I was like, holy shit, how did I forget that this is what I am? And like, it was honestly like terrifying at the same time. It was like, holy shit, that's what I am? Like whatever I am from this perspective, it's horrifying to a certain degree, right? And and so then it shot bolts of energy into me and my consciousness started accelerating like quicker and quicker to the point that I woke up in bed screaming next to uh, my wife, right? Uh, okay, so six months after that, we're having sex and completely unbeknownst to me, my wife starts having a spontaneous hallucination 
conversation where she starts communicating with this otherworldly entity, which tells her roughly the exact same thing, that I am some kind of incarnation of some ancient she said it was kind of like a Polynesian god. And then when I came, it showed her her god face. This is all in my book. And so there's this whole thing. No, I'm not even, and this is what's so I mean, crazy. And, and again, yeah, I'm no, laughing and again, just how, how epic it is. Yeah, it is, it is epic. And, and then what's so funny is like, and yeah, and, and that, that's what's so bizarre. It's like, oh, well, this stuff's just in my head. And yet then here's this thing my wife is telling me. Like, I didn't know this was happening at all. And right. then like, so like I finish up and then my wife is like telling me this after the fact. Like, oh, by the way, <laughs> I just That's had this nuts. weird communication. Yeah, no, it's only looking at like this whole like thing in my book because I made her write it down, and so you can read it from her perspective. Like, it's, it's, yeah, one of one of my weirder magic magical achievements. And what's so funny is like I talk about that, and a lot of people are like, when I say I have more in common with like you know UFO UFO cont- contactees and stuff like that, it wasn't until I read uh, the book The Supernatural that was by like, Whitley Strieber and Jeff, Jeff, Jeffrey Cripple. I haven't read Strieber stuff in, in years, but that guy's got weird sex magic stories that put that shit that I just told you to shame. <laughs> he has stories that are like, holy fuck, that is so much weirder than like inducing a weird uh, 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 visionary transmission in your wife. You know, like he is talking about other entities that are making him worship up the altar with like hallucinogenic uh, vaginal uh, secretions that, yeah, I mean, like, <laughs> so yeah, no. Yeah, I, I, it's not it's not far out here, but yeah, there's absolutely something to sex magic. So, anyways, yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> sorry, I, I get a little sidetracked. No, I was no, supposed please, to be talking yeah. about yeah, I was supposed to be talking about ways to induce this. So yeah, I mean that's honestly, and, and not enough people. I've only had a few people like try this, and I say this, and it's very simple. So basically, yeah, pick a symbol, you know, smoke some pot, induce your altered state of consciousness, envision that symbol while you're practicing some basic sex magic. And uh, continue envisioning the symbol. Look at the symbol as something very general that you want to see happen in your life. I would, and that's the thing is, I can't stress it enough. To me, intent is much more important than any amount of rituals that you want. Like, oh, I can't I stress agree. it enough. Yeah, intent is agree. everything. Your intentions, this is what I'm talking about. If you're not doing it for the greater good of the whole, it's not going to work. And, right. and what it's probably going to do is just point that out to you. You know, what's probably going to do is point out to you, like, dude, you were doing that for selfish fucking reasons. And all we did was just show you why you were, you know, right. it's like, make you, so make you figure it out. Be very vague too. This is the other crazy thing about my men and my magic. It's like, this is the problem. You don't know what you want at all. You have to be reaching, make it very vague. Like I want something I, you know, if, if you are really passionate, uh, yeah, I would say if you're really passionate about what you're doing, I would say, help me do this thing that I'm doing that I'm really passionate about. If you think you know your purpose, if you don't think you know your purpose, if you're lost, then make that the purpose you're meant to take. Show me what I should be doing. Like these are basic spells that if I was going to design a rudimentary, you know, sigil or an image that you're going to sign, that's the kind of thing that I would assign. That would be my recommendation. And make sure that what you're doing is like the goal to that is if I find this thing that I'm going to supposed to be doing, it's going to be for the betterment of the entire collection collective consciousness and if i'm going to get better at this thing that i want to pursue i'm going to do that for the betterment of the of, you know the, the elevation of human consciousness that's a good i think intent to so do that and then um so have your orgasm and then just lie flat on your back and then in, in enter continue visualizing these images or whatever image you pick. And then I don't like rudimentary sigils either. I like, I mean, pick a cool image, pick, pick something that looks cool and, and imagine that in your head, you know, and try to hear music in your head too. Like I don't hear this enough. Like as a musician, and this is becoming like increasingly, I've been showing this recently where it's just like, your visualizations are shit, dude. Like you need to be music. That's the power. That's more powerful than the visual side of it. You know, it's like, you need, you need to be envisioning yourself as sound. Like that's, you know, and this is basically what the spirits have been showing me. And they're right. You know, in fact, I've had specific exercises recently where, you know, I've been sort of being challenged by this dark energy and, you know, it's just shown. And like, I'm trying to do all these visualizations to get rid of this dark energy. And eventually it was like, the whole point of that exercise is with the sound. And the second I really started focusing on sound, it was like, bam, well, you know, dark vibes gone, like mission accomplished. That was the whole, you know, like that's what we were trying to show you with that. It's like fixate on sound. So think about that, lie on your back and then just let yourself enter a hypnagogic state. Now where this gets tough is then picking up what you encounter in that state, you know? And I will say that's something that I've had to work on quite a bit over the years. Is Could you, you have add like, a like brief- automatic writing? to that or yeah oh, yeah, no. and this is, translate it read my book I, I have channel books and like 
I channel a lot of stuff through dream and astral states, but a lot of stuff that I channel is in this like these hypnagogic states that I induce. I'll get into the state, and I love that Young had the term active imagination. I was reading that one day, and I'm like, yeah, that's exactly what it is. So I put myself in this state of crazy active imagination, and yeah, I, I will straight up start hearing voices in my head. I will start having a lot of times I have weird like kind of rapid hypnagogic dreams, and then and so that's the tough thing is those dreams making a habit of like remembering that shit. Like because a lot of times it'll be like a lot of information packed in like a quick little jolt and like when you pull yourself out of it like you know i think i mean i'm not gonna say it's not easy especially if you're high <laughs> like you know it's like actually getting to the point where you're actually learning from that shit because it's really easy to lose it and then just stress out to sleep so really putting a lot of effort into like okay when that happens like kind of pulling yourself out and really going over it so you remember what's so weird is i don't even typically get up and write it down i think most people would probably have to do that i typically to get to the point where I'm going to remember it the next day and I can write it down the next day. But yeah, I mean, it really is. If, if, I, if I was going to say the other thing where, yeah, like I said, that kind of differentiates me from uh, most of the occult stuff that I read is like, I don't know, man, in, in my mind, they're, the fact that the human imagination, like when you say still, even with the occult revival and whatnot, when you say that you're in the magic or, uh, you know, you're a sorcerer, or I, I, I personally am increasingly like the same space wizard, um, is, is, you know, when you say this, people are like, oh, you're fucking crazy, man. You know, that's crazy. And yet it's based on sound fucking science. Like there are so many different aspects of the human imagination that we know scientifically for a fact that the human imagination seemingly has limitless possibility, limitless potentiality. And this is a science fact that, you know, uh, it's very occluded. This is like the most occult thing. It is absolute science fact. There are things like disassociative diet, dis identity disorder. So there are so many things that point to, point to this. And, and some of them aren't even controversial. You know, like I said, there, there's like things that nobody will even argue with, like disassociative identity disorder, uh, meditation. Now there's so much information about how beneficial and how, you know, strange meditation can be. Um, savantism, which, and people don't, some people don't get it. It's not just like a cystic savant, but have these crazy mental abilities some people get like kicked in the head or being in the head and then just instantly develop abilities inarguable science fact there's hypnosis like that is a, just an utterly insane aspect of our psychology that we just ignore lucid dreaming fact people lucid dream this is a scientifically proven fact we've proven this like people have communicated with people on the other side you know through lucid dream this was proven back in the 70s there's been an increasing amount of research that that's shown you know um that uh, with uh, very minimal results, like with practice, something like 30% of people can teach themselves how to lose a dream in a week, you know, with just basically using standard techniques. So, I mean, and, and then there's psychedelic drugs. And none of the things that I just mentioned, I just mentioned like six different phenomena that all point to the potentiality of human imagination. And none of them are even controversial at this point. Like, no, there is no scientist that's going to argue that, no, those aren't things. Like, you know, those are all known, bizarre aspects of, uh, that all point in the direction that this sorcery shit is legit. And, and so, man, I'm all about, like, there's some supreme mysteries there. Like, we should be looking into this. This should be our big branch of science. And, I, you know, it's in, like, most of the cold articles that I read are, you know, it's like, it doesn't really have that much to do with that stuff. <laughs> you know, like, I mean, truly honest. I'm like, I don't know what this, I don't know what like lighting the bright candles at the right time has to do with exploring the potential of the human imagination. I think it's you know? more, more Sometimes about it does. ceremony, uh, just imprinting stuff in your subconscious, you know, it's like, it's, uh, putting all the pomp yeah. and circumstance in it just elevates that intensity to make you really yeah. that, that intentfulness, you know? No, and so, it's not, and it's not like I don't engage in rituals and stuff like that. But right. I guess you're right. I'm all about. I want to know how to fucking activate these weird parts of the imagination. I want to explore that and inducing and and, and inducing these and in, in, in all states of consciousness and dream states and trance states and learning totally. from the spirit realm in those states. That's my jam, you know. Like, yeah, well, <laughs> if you ask me talking... about like goetic spirits, I get a lot of questions about like weird out there spiritual practices, and I'm just like weird like occult stuff, and I'm like, man, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, I was talking yeah. to um, somebody recently. We were talking about currents, you know. When you do mm -hmm. a traditional method, it's almost like this this uh, transcendental current that's happening outside of time and space, where you're connecting a lineage. So I can kind of see the the benefit in keeping or yeah. practicing some of those traditions, especially if it's important to you. Then your subconscious is going to react to it more, I think. But uh, I wanted to, yeah. to ask you, 
Mr. Mm-hmm. Former Editor of Disinfo.com. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, what's what's on the editor docket? Includes, that's what I love about the term editor in that context is that yeah. I openly told people I don't really have time to edit your shit. <laughs> like, uh, oh yeah. Try and edit it most yourself. Like yes, I, I was more kind of like a curator, I suppose, than editor. But anyway, you go. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you what what's next on the docket. I know you have a book coming out and a record, right? Uh, yes, I do. Yeah. So sort of the weird thing with this info, and, and I was like, when that opportunity you know, came up. I was sort of only half-assing that site because I was already in the middle of writing a book and finishing a book and a record. Um, and those are both really close to being done. So actually the record is done. I'm just kind of working on my promotional strategy at this point. It should be out the next uh, couple months or probably actually early. I would say early 2019 is probably going to come out. Uh, and that's black science. So look out for that. Um, and I have another book coming out. I have two books out already. Um, the Galactic Dialogue of the Cold, uh, the Galactic Dialogue of Cold Initiations and Transmissions from Outside of Time. If what you're listening to here sounds interesting, I highly recommend uh, reading Transmissions from Outside of Time. I, <laughs> it is funny in saying you were going to ask me, hey, which book do you recommend? I'm like, I think that one is a million times better. I have a new book coming out that is all about uh, how I did well largely about how I did rituals to contact this ancient demon that I was referencing before that like communicated with my wife. And, and, and so this, in, this next book I'm coming out again, it's an entirely channeled book. And that's what's so weird about transmissions. Uh, like uh, my first book was like kind of half channel channeled. It was about a bunch of weird things that happened, but there was still a lot of me writing about like things in my personal life and throwing a lot of big words in there and like kind of <laughs> writing, you know, and then transmission from out of time is primarily just a channeled book. And this book is again, just a channel book. And it is largely about what we didn't get into that as much. What, what the demonic world has, has shown me about what it is and, and how it's controlling humanity behind the scenes through things like drugs and uh, like shitty drugs and the, the war machine and, 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 and the Coke psychology of uh, the Coke and meth psychology of Ayn Rand, except in a very literal way and how none of this is actually nearly as horrible as that sounds. You know? <laughs> this is the fucked up thing about me. I'm like writing about this. Like I was just, I actually just had an experience recently where I was thinking about my book And I, and this booming voice kind of came into my head while I was thinking about it and sort of reminded me like, this is going, this book is going to kind of, kind of going to scare the shit out of people, (laughs) you know, (laughs) like a David Ikean sort of, well, no, not in that way. And that it really, it, it does confirm, I think some people's worst fears because there are so, so many, I mean, this is what like Christian theology is based on is that there's these demons that are controlling rea- reality these demonic forms of analysis yeah. And, yeah and so what i'm sort of telling them is like well yeah that's accurate but <laughs> it, it's not a negative thing and i think i really need to get, yeah and it, well anyways i had this experience and then i was working on some of the final edits of this book and i was like oh yeah 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 i see what you're talking about <laughs> i see why some of this stuff would really scare the shit out of a lot of people uh so i guess i really have to uh put a, a spin on it to uh continually remind them that you know this, when is this, so when this, is that uh it should be out in 2019 as well so both that out in the book should be out uh by 2019 so uh yeah, absolutely. Look out for it, for sure. Awesome. And any any kind of contributing writing now that this um, is for the moment, I'm pretty much going to focus on getting those projects done. But yeah, I'm going to so, definitely yeah. start when those are done. I'm going to definitely start pitching some more shit around. And uh, yeah, I mean the writing bugs is it is weird that I, I have spent you know I I can kind of kind of consider myself. I like playing music and doing visual art more than I like writing. And yet because of this info and that being more popular by far than anything else that I was doing, I really have spent a lot more time, you know, writing and going on podcasts and shit than over the last God, nearly five years of my life. So uh, (laughs) yeah, hopefully I'll put some of that energy into doing music and getting that. But yeah, no, I'll, I'm sure I'll be up and writing somewhere soon, but yeah, as, as, I just found about disinfo about like two weeks ago. So yeah, right. <laughs> the, the goal is actually to take a, a bit of time off of like really pursuing uh, uh, writing outside of my book at this point. So yeah, how about yourself, man? What do you you get? You're you're uh, you got kicking the podcast up under. You got that new Dakota Slim album out. I was checking yeah. that out actually. Yeah, really dug it. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, kind of uh, waiting for some visual um, accompaniment with that record right now before I give it a a big press push, but it's the fun part where I'm, 
you know, doing stuff to kind of help promote it in ways that I don't care about making money about, you know, <laughs> so, so doing fun <laughs> videos or uh, weird performances here and there. And yeah, this podcast, it's, it keeps me, keeps me humble and it keeps me fresh with, you know, a lot of ideas and people that whose work I enjoy. I wanted to do an audio mancy kind of sub series and told, dedicate a couple episodes to, you know, say you and some other folks that really experience that. Absolutely. You know, it's always good to talk to somebody. Like I always refer to it as auditory sorcery and you were using the term audio mancy. This other guy that I was actually talking about, who started doing like a church where he was doing psychedelic rituals and he was calling it photomancy. So I'm glad Ooh. that this is a, it is funny because this was, I mean, before the, well, I guess it was about the same time we got an ask objection, but yeah, I mean, the audiomancy, the photomancy, the, uh, the auditory sorcery, as I call it, like this, this was my first project. Like this is, like I said, I was that weird guy that, you know, everybody was like beer girls when they like got into college. And I'm like, I'm going to like hold in my room and like, fuck with my own head with music and psychedelics. Oh, totally. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> and, and, and the tradition continues. You know, I'm still doing well, I can't, it I can't take credit for the audio, man. See, that, that, uh, yeah. that was, I, I came across that from a writer named Ezra Sanzer Bell, who wrote a oh, cool. book of the same name. And it was really just the confluence between metaphysical ideas and musical theory. But I used to call them when I was a kid, because I used to do the same. I would make tape collages out of, yeah. crazy found instrument stuff and construct these like mutant you know melodies and stuff i used to call them dims because i found out after a while if i uh anchored it with some physical action like strumming one disc discordant chord or chanting and doing that for you know over a half an hour that i would hit these trances where like this reality would dim and i could kind of see a little bit beyond you know not not yeah. clear, but definitely, you know, more than just, uh, yeah, more than more than just here. So tearing tearing dimensional rifts be exactly. it out, man. That, that's yeah. what it's all about. Well, I'm that's definitely about, gonna I'm gonna contact you once that record's finished. You want to want to talk about that too? Yeah, yeah, man. It should be out soon. I will make sure that you know about it for sure. And yeah, yeah, cool. I would love to. Uh, to uh, work on some audio mancy at some point. Yeah, good, good also, to talk to a fellow fellow audio mancer. <laughs> word. Well, also, why don't you send me a track um, well, that I can throw at the end of this podcast here so people can... Oh, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, and, uh, yeah, anybody that wants to check out my music right now, um, uh, you can look at DMI Occult, DMI Occult dot Bandcamp dot com. Uh, it's a lot... Of, actually, if you look... Uh, Somebody just threw it on YouTube too. I guess so. Yeah, dmicult.bandcamp.com, and I'll uh, yeah, I'll email you a link right now where you can probably just pull it up and check it out. And yeah, uh, Black Science, uh, that's the most popular thing that I've done. Uh, yeah, definitely check it out, man. Cool. Yeah, check I'll, it I'll out. Tag it at the end you, of everybody that's listening, uh, yeah, dmicult.bandcamp.com. If you throw Black Science and Echo through the eyes of forever. Again, I talk really fast. Black Science and Echo from the Eyes of They're on the YouTube. It's up there as well. It's, it, that stuff used to be on the... I'm going to have to renew the Spotify shit on all that. Like, oh, man. <laughs> I feel you. Up there. I, I went through like a site that like charged you by the year or two, and eventually the world uh, ran out. I did out, that. So. DistroKid? So, <laughs> what's that? I went through DistroKid, and uh, for this last album, I realized that there are apps where you can do it for free. And like I had been yeah. using a distribution company for years for all my old albums, and was, there's no need. Yeah. There's absolutely no need to pay for that. No, I, well, yeah, there's no need. You can do it manually, and but like even like CD Baby for like thirty dollars now, they'll just put it like on all those sites for you. Right. <laughs> so like they're literally, but and, and they don't charge you. But you're right. I can't remember which one I went through. It was God. Yeah, but it was stupid because they basically yeah they told you they charge you like a yearly fee for albums and yeah. the funny thing it was actually making enough to pay for it for years and i just actually noticed like one of them i think is still up and i think they just sent me like an email being like okay that <laughs> so it was right. like any royalties i was making were just going to like re-putting the thing on the site for those <laughs> yearly fees <laughs> ridiculous yeah That's and you're right rough. now there's like tons of there's tons of places that just do it like either one piece they'll put it on all those sites for, for you this, or you can actually just do it manually. For so, this album, for this last album, I literally used a phone app and it <laughs> blasted nice. it 
to you know Spotify, all, all the places. Because I was just experimenting. I was like, if it doesn't work, no, no one cares. No, one cares. <laughs> one's gonna give a yeah. shit. And it did. It worked and didn't cost me a dime. It was like, man, I'm an nice. idiot for paying for licensing stuff. But anyways, thank oh, you so for much for uh, thanks for taking the that. time. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Yeah, man. Oh, wait, good talking to you. Yeah, I will definitely keep you updated. Like I said, I'm I'm should be out soon. And yeah, man. Uh, good good work with Dakota Swim. Uh, yeah, like I said, I was really digging that. It was really hey. really really unique. I got to listen to some more of it. Definitely. Well, thanks. I appreciate it. And uh, let's have one on uh, disinfo for me tonight. Yeah, exactly. Pour, pour out some for your dead websites, everybody. That's right. and, and you know the the one thing I will say to close it out is. It is possible the owner's trying to sell it. It is entirely possible that somebody is going to buy it and is not entirely dead. I would say the likelihood, if somebody did do that, you would have to have some deep pockets to try and get the audience back. That's part of the reason I didn't is because it's just like above top secret lost so much to the audience. Like I knew for a fact that if it goes dark, like, you know, hey, so I hope there is a faint possibility that somebody has enough funds and know how to revive that site. So maybe it's not dead forever, but uh, until then, yeah, pour one out, man. And uh, real quick, though, I forgot to ask the articles that were on there for other contributors that didn't have backups or anything. Is that just kind of all gone? <laughs> It is all gone. He destroyed the yeah. WordPress engine. Um, I, I think it's sort of the equivalent of legally like uh, uh, burning your documents. Uh, okay. Plus, I don't. I know for a fact that he, like me or he or I, really had no much about. Unfortunately, that site was hard coded with a lot of like it wasn't an easy thing to manipulate. Just like basic WordPress, it was like right. really customized, which made it tough. Uh, and neither. Uh, but um, um, yeah. That's why uh, you always save archive. a copy. So, Exactly. Somebody pointed this out to me, and I did have a couple of people freaking out. There is good news for any contributors. Yes, there's a site called webarchive.com, I believe. Just look up Web Archive. You type in the Wayback Machine. This info has been backed up there a million times. It's a bit slow, but if you have any idea around the time that you post your shit, you should absolutely be able to go there and there and oh, find it. In cool. fact, I went and recovered a bunch of shit that I did because it's so weird. I actually have all the shit that I wrote, but when I was thinking about it, it was like, I probably put that into WordPress and then made a few last edits. So I actually went through, yeah, one day at work, I had some time, and I went through and, like, grabbed all the stuff and when it aired, and it's all on Wayback Machine. And so, yeah, if you're ever looking for a vintage distance, it's actually pretty cool because it actually archives how the site looked back when it was when that stuff aired. So you can oh, actually cool. see the changes in the site. So it's actually, I nobody, I'd never heard of this website, but I'm so glad that it exists. And so, yeah, you can actually find everything going back like 20 years of distance. So I don't know how far it goes back, but yeah, it's all oh, that's awesome. like way, web, web archive.org. And it's in the way back machine. Just type in disinfo.com and you can pick like tons of years and points to look at. So yeah, anybody that lost anything, you should be able to find it there for sure. Well, there you have it, folks. Thad McCracken. Down below in the show notes, I will have links to his books, his music, his writing. I told him I'd include one of his songs, and as much as I'd love to, I'm a little worried about file size, because guess what? Um, I don't have major hosting for the podcast. But if you want to help me get major hosting, consider being a Patreon at patreon.com slash we the hallowed or giving us a one-time donation there'll be a donate button down below uh, the email address for paypal is we the hallowed at gmail or spare spells at gmail.com anyways i'm going to keep this short uh but i do want to mention that next episode my major milestone in that it is episode 10 will finally unearth the interview between my father and the one and only Robert Anton Wilson. And yes, you can find it with some sleuthing online, but I'll give you some insights into its history and hopefully get my dad to relish and revel in the past and discuss a little bit about his meeting with the one and only Raw. So anyways, stay tuned for that. I hope to start vlogging, um, getting some videos on YouTube about my personal journey and things, tactics, spells, tricks, and stuff I use to enhance the creative process and just to be a better dude. Um, and with that, haunt on.